Last week we started a short series about how we should think about the news. And we talked about how we should think biblically about the news. Uh, I will pick up that series next week. I thought I would take a, a short break on it because last Sunday evening I received a phone call because Brother Terry McLean had passed on to glory. He had died. Uh, and so this has been on my mind this last week as well as other people. And I thought it would be a great testimony to speak about and use his death as a springboard to talk about what we should think about death when Christians die. Uh, many of us have had friends and family die, no doubt. Uh, there is a different way that Christians think about death than non-Christians. And I want to really target that. When a saint dies, especially one who knew uh, who Christ was and knew who they were in Christ and knew the glories of God's grace, according to the Bible, rightly divided, uh, when their spouse and Sister Carol understands these things, it changes your response and your approach to death. It really does, because the Bible speaks about death, and we who are Christians who know the Scripture ought to have some information about the reality of it, the bad and the good, and also the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and His crucifixion, His resurrection, changes what we think about death. So I want to really target that this morning. Okay, uh, Death is terrible. Death is unstoppable. And that makes for a bad combination. Because that means everybody dies. Just as 3.19 says, when uh, the first man sinned and death came in by sin, that uh, from dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so you may have heard the saying, ashes to ashes, earth to earth, dust to dust. And there's not a verse in the Bible that has that phrase. Historically, that comes from the, the Book of Common Prayer, from the Anglican tradition. And a lot of that, by the way, the Book of Common Prayer has a lot of influence on our traditional Christian culture. It not being the Bible, but taken from things like that. But the idea of, uh, that we're made from dust, we're going to return to dust, that is scriptural in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we, are, we are made from dirt. What made us special was that God breathed his life into us. That's it. And then Adam sinned, and by one man sin entered in death by sin, and so all die as a result. Death is a terrible thing. Death is a self-inflicted disease that humanity has inflicted on itself. Okay? But it's also a testimony of sin and the presence of sin. Right? It's a terrible thing. Uh, it's man's worst affliction. Looking on the CDC website, among others, you can find a very common list of causes of death. Uh, and uh, of the 3 million people who will die in the U.S. this year, okay, on average, 75% will die from one of these top 10 causes. Heart disease being number one, uh, cancer being number two, accidents being number three. Uh, there's a big category of accidents have the third leading cause of death. And those three right there make up 50% of the deaths. So there's a 50% chance if you die in America, you're going to die from one of those three things. Then follows uh, lung disease, lung problems, stroke, Alzheimer's, or brain disorders, diabetes, flu and pneumonia, kidney diseases, and then trailing the list of 10 and growing is suicide, which is people taking their own life. Uh, so you have these top leading causes of death in America. It's not much different across the world, except in some more uh, poor places. You might find malnutrition and, and things like that rising on the list. But these top ten are pretty standard. Um, I bring this up because not many people think about how they will die. And many people have the vain hope that, well, that happens to other people and not to me. All of us are going to die. Right? And most likely, 75% chance you're going to die from one of those problems right there. You know it. The problem, however, with death is that you don't know when, right? And some people don't know why. And then uh, most people don't know or don't think anything happens after you die. And so it really is a hopeless and vain thing to even consider your death because it's not time yet, right? Why think about things that are too far in the future? Well, you don't know that. Or secondly, that is just going to cause me to be depressed, I mean, really, it's like the end of things, the loss of life. I don't have to live anymore, no more opportunity. And that's horrible. It's terrible, like I said already. The Bible teaches that as well. After you die, all the things you've accumulated, all the things that you have, all the things you worked for, will be passed on or destroyed. Justin, you're really preaching hope this morning, aren't you? Yes, uh, before hope, you have to realize the darkness, right? And this is the reality. And this is something the Bible communicates. The Bible speaks truth and reality. One way you know the Bible is true is it speaks about these things really. 
we all die, and, and most of the world don't want to talk about that, right? After you die, your things will be given away, maybe to people in your will. You just give off some things, and some of them may not want the things you have, unless they're shiny, you know, maybe they will. Others will be sold off, as you don't need them anymore, it's going to sell them, or given to goodwill, thrown away, the things that maybe you liked, the things that had sentimental value to you, but really were worthless to everyone else, goes in the trash heap. I mean, no one wants them, except for you, and you're gone, right? These, this is what happens to the things that are in your house, in your bedroom, right? In your life, the things you're wearing, right? You're dyed, you're you don't need your clothes anymore. Gone. My favorite shirt, doesn't matter, right? That's death. First Timothy 6, verse 7 says, we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we can take nothing out. That's First Timothy 6, verse 7. The Bible teaches that. That is contrary, by the way, to many other false religions that think that somehow we can translate the success, achievements, attainments you have in this life to the next life, as far as the material things. And so the most common popular understanding, historical understanding of this was in the Egyptian uh, culture, where they would put things in these tombs, or build these giant elaborate pyramid tombs to kings, because they thought, well, if we put more golden things in there, it'll give them currency in the afterlife. And that's just nonsense. Now, it's nonsense to us with an understanding of the Bible from a Christian perspective. But if you don't know any different, and you believe in an afterlife, how do you know? I might as well cover your bases, you know? Put ten bucks in the, in, in the casket. But the Bible communicates and informs us about the reality of death. Okay? And death's a painful thing. Like I said, many people have kind of a vain hope or maybe a, a neglect or ignorance of it. Uh, they say, well, it's not going to happen to me that way. Um, you often say this when we're young because, you know, I'm healthy. Everyone else is dying, but I'm, I'm fine. Uh, but then you start getting in your 30s and your 40s or 50s and you're going, I'm breakable. You know? uh, and so you, I can maybe stop living. And your mortality becomes evident. Or when you start realizing that people that you have relationships with die. When you're real young, you don't really have relationships beyond just a few years of who you are, your family, and this sort of thing. But as you get a little older, you start having relationships with people that are 20, 30, 40, 50 years older than you. And they start to die. And you're going, wow, relationship broken. Relationship gone. You know, There's a lot of pain in death. It's clearly happened to everyone. It's going to happen to you, too. Death is not a source of pleasure. Again, why would we talk about this? You're going to bring displeasure, sadness. Uh, you're going to bring pain to people to think about it, even to go through it. It's not a pleasure for men. This is where the idea in the scripture, uh, when it talks about society and the way people respond to these things in life, that people tend to think, well, we're going to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. What? We die, right? So the idea is we're going to focus on now. I mean, we're going to enjoy life now. Because, I mean, you have the ability to do that now. Why think about death? Because that's the end. And it's horrible. It's not a pleasure for men. Thus, pleasure is now. Tomorrow, we'll have this thing that's not pleasurable. In the future. We'll put that there. Right? We're not going to give any more attention to it than what it deserves. Ezekiel 18, verse 32 tells us that God does not pleasure in death. He says he has no pleasure in those who die and those who have death. And so he appeals to them <clears throat> in Ezekiel 18. To turn ye from death and live. And you're going, well, if we would, we could. You know. But God's saying that in Ezekiel 18. He has no pleasure in those that die. And he said, and God is the one that always offers life. He's the one that gave life. And so he says, here's the opportunity you have for life. And in the Old Testament, Ezekiel it had to do with their following his commandments, right? Which in his covenant with Israel was a stipulation that he would grant them longer life and healthier life if they obeyed. This is where you get some Christians who fail to rightly divide think that same covenant applies to them. Well, if I do right by God, then he'll do right by me. I'll, I'll live a long, healthy life and just die suddenly in my sleep. Um, well, this concept comes from Israel's covenant where it's like, yeah, God promised that if they did these things, then he would bless them in such ways, physical ways. Okay. Even Paul quotes uh, one of the, the commandments about honoring your father and mother. And what did he say about that commandment, which is back in the law, that you'll live longer. You live long and prosper if you honor your father and mother. That was Star Trek, I think, actually. But, you know, it's a similar, similar concept. Um, but, yeah, this idea that if you obey God's law, you, you'll live longer. But still, you die. Living longer, you say, that's great. I mean, scientists every couple of years make the claim, it's the same claim every couple of years, because they haven't really succeeded. The same claim is that scientists are on the brink of learning how we might live to be 120 or 130. You're going, that'd be great. Instead of like 100 or 80 or 90, 120 or 30, it's just a few years extra. And then what? You're pushing death out and you still die. You see, death's still there. You can't escape it. 
Even if scientists discover the gene that allows us to live a few years longer, and I totally believe that they can, because the Bible tells me that people used to live hundreds of years. And so I think it is possible for humans to live longer than they do now. Right? People can try to figure this out. The problem, however, is that humans can't live forever because of the mortality of their flesh. Now, this is what gets certain futurists excited and thinking, well, we just, the problem is our bodies. We get rid of our bodies because our bodies are going to break down eventually and we replace it with something that will last forever, like hard drives. Um, point of question, hard drives don't last forever. Right? <laughs> your data on your, I mean, anyone that has a floppy disk from the 80s realize that, that technology is out of date. I mean, you'd hate to, to, to count, you know, trust your life on technology that won't go out of date. It's going to go out of date. And who transfers your life at that point? You say, well, I will. I'll be controlling the robots and the machines. Well, we're a far way from that, except for in the movies. Death is always here. It's a part of reality. It's part of humanity. And it's painful, not just because thinking philosophically we don't, can't stop it and it's always going to happen. Um, but there's a sting to death. That's the problem, too. It's like when death happens, it hurts. I just don't mean the physical pain when you actually die, which is a thing also. But you can die peacefully, you know, without much pain. But there's a sting of death that affects us personally and others. It's sad. When people die, the natural response, and it's natural because this is what you feel, is that that's sad. You offer condolences, which is to say, I recognize the sadness of the situation, and I sympathize. And this is a natural response. Because death afflicts us all. There's nothing wrong with this response. It's painful. Why is it painful? It's interesting to reflect on this. You know, why is death so painful? Why is it so sad? Why? Why is it a knee-jerk natural reaction when we get sad when people die? It's because, yeah, there's lots of reasons. Um, one is due to timing sometimes. When people die unexpectedly or before their time, as people say, right? Or when you weren't ready yet. Timing can hurt. It's like it's better to be in control, Right? I'll, I'll, I'll go to the store when I want to go to the store. And I'll do that when I want to. Well, you don't get to choose when you die. And this is one reason, by the way, why suicides are a thing. Because people who commit suicide do control when they die. You say, why is that? Because the loss, that's the only thing they think they can control. Right? And that's going to be a problem. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But you lose, not having control of the timing is an issue. What well, loss I mean, loss, loss of other people, loss of your stuff. I'd already talked about how your, your, your clothes and things we sold away, given away. I mean, so you worked your whole life for this stuff, and it's just gone now because you can't be alive to maintain and keep it, right? Losing things. There's fear, the fear of the unknown, the fear of not knowing what's going to happen, and there's religion and judgment, which is going to add to the, to the pain of death. We'll see that. Timing. A lot of times when people don't live a full life, when young people die, it's such a tragedy, right? It's a tragedy because... People typically live longer than that, and uh, you die when you're young. I think that the percentage of deaths in a year on average between the ages of, what was it, 5 and 14 is 1%. Which is very small, folks. You're more likely to die, apparently, before you reach the age of 5 than between 5 and 14. It's like, it's like 10 or 15% between 0 and 5, and then like 1% between 5 and 14, and then like 14 to 44, it's like another 15 or 20%. Most of us die after the age of 50 and 60. You know, which is normal. When people die when they're young, it's such a tragedy. It's like, wow, they had life to expect and it didn't happen. And the majority of deaths for that group, by the way, is accidents, you know, obviously. Less so heart disease, cancer, all those things that come from time. But uh, what a painful and sad thing that is. Also, even when people who are older die, uh, they may think, well, I didn't do all that I wanted to do. Regrets in life, right? You look back in your life and say, did I do what I wanted to accomplish? Maybe I didn't. And so death's going to be a painful thing. I don't, I don't even have the time. I probably don't have the time left to do what I wanted to do. What about grudges you hold with people? Either grudges you hold to others or the grudges that others held to you. Not being able to reconcile with people when they die. This is a hurtful thing. Right? I wish I could have made peace with them before they died. Right? What about things left unsaid? It's a common thing. I didn't get to say goodbye. I didn't get to say I love you. I didn't get to say something. Right? It's a common source of death and grief. Uh, of pain and, and death. Not enough time hurts. L loss hurts. Every time there's a great dip in the stock market, and you say, that's just money. Yes, but for some people that matters. There's always an increase in suicides, and the stock market drops for various reasons. Unemployment, or people had all their life savings in the stock market, everything else. It's like they lost a bunch, and they can't deal with it. Life's not worth it, right? And so they, they give up. But just losing people by natural death is a loss. 
people that we love, right? People you spent time with and developed memories with, had relationships with, you invested your life in them, you got joy from them, you, you were happy because of them, and you lose that. That's sad, right? So my life spent with these people that I love, and now they're gone, where am I going to get this love? Where am I going to get this joy? Where am I going to have all these good memories that I have with these people that are now gone? Right? And that hurts. The loss of love things hurts. Sometimes, and oftentimes, this is the reason people uh, mourn when people die at funerals and are so sad by it and grieve because their whole life was wrapped up in the people that had died. And this is not a wrong thing to do that. I mean, you have relationships. And they die, and suddenly there's, what else is there? How do I live? Right? It hurts. But going backwards, there's the fear of death. Some people fear death. Other people don't fear death. The fear of the unknown. What happens after we die? We don't know. When is it going to happen? We don't know. How is it going to happen? We don't know. Is it going to hurt? We don't know. Right? There's lots of things we know. We don't know a lot of things about death. Yes, yeah, scientists even. Why do we die? And they'll give you the scientific observations of what happens when your body breaks down. But we still don't know why we die. Not like the process that happens when we die. Like, why is it a thing? Right? Because for some part of your life, your body seems to work contrary to death. Like, it keeps growing and developing, and it's refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. And then suddenly, it's like there's a peak, and then you start declining the rest of your life. Why does that happen? Right? Well, a gene does this, and a cell starts doing that. Well, yeah, you're observing what happens. But why? What triggers the thing? What, what's the cause? Because they don't even know what makes us alive. They can tell, what, they can tell if someone's alive. That's obvious. Like, how did life begin? Well, this is a scientific, we don't know. But we know we are alive. Just like we don't know why we die, but we know people are dead, and we know that it happens and how it does. There's a lot of unknowns around death. Why is it a thing? The loss of control, the, the end of things, the fear of having things be over, and that's it. That, that can make people afraid of death. It's like something that takes something from you, thus you have the grim reaper. Right? Big tool, taking things, harvesting, right? And so you have that. You know, things hurts. And then there's religion that adds to it. A lot of people despise religion. Other people uh, hold on to religion. Uh, either way, religion provides another thing to concern yourselves over regarding death. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's destined for man once to die and then to face the judgment. Right? Oh, well, I didn't know what would happen, and now you're doing me the privilege of knowing what happens, and what you tell me happens is judgment. Thank you. So now, my whole life that I've lived, I'm anxious about whether or not I've lived good enough in order to pass this judgment. Right? This is the thing religion provides to the table. No, 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 religion's great. Is it great? I mean, I'm talking about religion here, not just like Christianity, but like religion. The fact that you might face a judgment before an all-knowing deity can be a source of anxiety. Right? Have I done enough? Did I do it right? Am I going to be pleasing to him? How do I know this? He hasn't spoken to me, right? So how do I know? Judgment. How will it turn out? The anxiety hurts. I bring all this up just to show us the state of affairs that exists when people die and about death in, in the world. And this is true. has been true for millennia, right? And, um, and people respond in their own ways. A lot of people, times people respond with saying, well, even though we've lost these people, they could live on in our memories and live on by us enjoying life that they can't. People find solace in this, right? And this is typically the response. It's like, well, they're gone, but we're still here, and we're going to continue living perhaps the way they intended for us to live. And that is a source of comfort, and people grab onto that, and that's what they do until they die. And then we kind of pass on this cycle of, well, you keep living. You know, we're done with, done with life, but you can press on. You can keep going. Right? And so it's the, it's the living. It's your turn now. Right? We're done. And uh, even though it's sad, it at least saves people from hopeless despair. Because at least life is still here. I mean, the only time that comfort wouldn't work was when the last person dies. You know, but then what's the point of that? Of course, evolution teaches that the universe will, will die a heat death in which there will be nothing living in the universe ever again. Death is the end of the evolutionary theory. Death is the end of all humanity. Death is the end of humanism. Death is always at the end, staring humans in the face, saying, this is where you're heading towards. There is no hope for you. That's what death is. Death, in the Bible says it comes from sin, and death is final. It's over for you. Right? You won't live like this anymore. 
But the Bible then goes on to speak about hope that God provides, God the creator of life, God the judge of sin. He also provides in the scripture, this is the main theme of the Bible, how he can provide you eternal life. Right? Okay, well we knew this, and this is something some people didn't know about the scripture, most people in our culture do, but most people don't realize, I think, what it means that you get eternal life, and what that does to change our perspective on death. As I just presented death as being a hopeless type of thing, something we don't want to think about a whole lot, something we can only find comfort in, the fact that we're still alive and they're gone. The Bible tells us something differently. And if the Bible is true about death, then Christians should think differently about it. And this is the teaching today. And, and I think that we all struggle with this because we're still in our flesh and we're still part of this world. We're still natural in our responses. The emotions are natural. But the scriptures, specifically the teachings of Christ, given to Paul, should change our minds so that the way we think about death as Christians and when Christians die is fundamentally different than how the world thinks of it and maybe how we think of it before we understood these truths and actually lived by them. The difference that we talked this morning is there's between knowing what the Bible says and then actually living and walking, letting it affect your emotional responses. It's a different thing, right? You can know truth, but to be joyful as a result of it, to be responsive to that truth, to make it affect your behavior, that's a different thing entirely. And this is the struggle Christians always have had with different things, different issues, and different uh, concepts about your walk in Christ and all that. But today I want to talk specifically about death, how Christ and his crucifixion changes the way we think about death. Okay? We've drawn dispensational charts before, and I'll draw another one here. <clears throat> Here's the beginning of the world. Here's the end of the world. We'll draw the cross as a reference. And we draw the most significant event in human history was the death of a man. That in itself should give you a hint of where I'm going here now. We've reached the valley of the hopelessness of death. We glory in the death of a man. Why? Why? This is horrible. Why would you glory in the thing that is man's greatest affliction? Right? Because there's something we know about what happened there. It provides some sort of hope, okay? But Hebrews chapter, in Hebrews chapter 2, <clears throat> God told Adam that if he ate that tree, he shall surely die. And that's what happened. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, So by one man sinned and death by sin. Hebrews chapter 2 describes the state of affairs before Christ came and died, as far as the way humanity views death. Hebrews 2, down in verse... 14 and 15. As much as the children of, uh, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. God took part of flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see that? The bondage of death. No matter what you do, how much good you do, no matter how much you attain, no matter how much you want to praise God and worship God and do right, death happens to you. You're under its bondage, you're under its power, you see, and that's the end. And so we have Hebrews 2 describing as death enters by one man, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 2, 15 says they're in bondage. This is describing humanity, specifically Israel, the Hebrews, bondage to death. Right? It has power over them. Right? That no one can stop. That's why I said at the very beginning, death is terrible and unstoppable. There's nothing we can do as human, a human race to stop the thing. Right? It has power over us. And what's more, as we covered in our second point, was that it hurts. It has power over us, and it hurts. It's one thing to have something have power over you, but if it was a pleasurable thing, then, you know, who cares? It hurts. That's worse. There's a sting of death. However, Christ solved the problem with death. So, by one man sin and death by sin, death being the righteous judgment for sin. But Christ died for sins. He shed his blood for sins. Right? And so, if death's the consequence to sin, and sin is justification for death, and that means you can't live, when Christ died for your sins, this means the cause of death was dealt with. The reason why death is justified in humanity is because of sin. Christ took that justification away when he died for sins, right? That's part of the gospel we preach. Christ died for your sins, which takes away the cause of death. And then what did he do? Well, he rose from the dead. 
And so he took away the cause of death, and then he takes away the power of death with the resurrection. It's like it's one thing to say, well, okay, humans can be justified because their sins are paid for. But to say, look, and as a man, I'm going to rise from the dead. Now humanity apparently has a way to defeat the power of death in the grave. I mean, people can raise from the dead. And resurrection, by the way, was a teaching in the Bible, even in the Old Testament. Okay. But what Christ did that was different was that he rose from the dead. He never dies again. Right? The question in the Old Testament was that God's promising resurrection and salvation, but we don't know how it's going to happen because we're under bondage here, and death's a pretty strong thing. Nothing can stop it. God comes in the form of a man, dies for the cause of sin, and remove that justification, and resurrects to defeat the power of death, and offers as a man to the rest of humanity, if you trust me, if you take my power, you can raise from the dead. And your sins can be forgiven based on what I did. And thus the gospel. Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. This is the good news of Christianity, right? And that's offered freely to you, which is the good news of God's grace. Right? And so this is good. Oh, great, finally some hope. Yes, hope, that's good. But if that's true, and we hopefully have that agreement that we all know the gospel and trust it, and we know the, the reason for it is death was our plague, Christ is our solution, Right? then how does that affect how we respond to death, the pain and sorrow and fear? Is it just that, okay, he solved it, glad he solved it? Or does it also affect the way we emotionally respond to things? Okay. I want to talk about that a little bit. Look at Revelation 21, verse 4. The Bible, God promised salvation. When death entered the, the, the human race through Adam, God even promised to Adam and Eve. He's, he, he promised to the, the devil. He said, you bru you'll bruise the, the head of the seed of the woman, but I'll bruise, or you'll bruise his heel, but I'll bruise your head. The promise was that I will defeat you and the power you have over these people. Death. Right? God promised from the beginning that he would save humanity. What was unfolding throughout history was the means through which he could do so. And even in the Old Testament prophets, it looked forward to a day of salvation. Job, one of the oldest characters of the Bible in the book that he wrote, says that he trusts and he believes that he will walk with his Redeemer on the earth. Right? So you've heard the verse from Job where he says, I'm going to, walk, I'm going to raise from the dead and walk with my Redeemer on this planet. And so we have here the future earth here. And uh, we have God's kingdom. Okay? Where it says in Revelation chapter 21 verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Which means what? There's nothing to cry about, right? The tears will be wiped away. There should be no more death. Death hurts, folks. We've been talking about that. No more death. That's awesome. Neither sorrow. I mean, removing death's one thing. Removing the sorrow of death is an entirely different thing. And he says, neither death nor sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. We've been talking about the sting and pain of death, right? When people die, it's like it hurts, and there's reasons why it hurts. And he says, here in Revelation 21, he says, no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. The, the main problem that humanity has is death. Sin, that causes death. He says, that's what I'm trying to remove, you see. God's trying to restore what they could have had here, which was eternal life, by God's provision. Right? So Revelation chapter 21 promises this. But let me bring something to your insight here. Revelation 21 hasn't happened yet. Right? I mean, we're still be before Revelation 21. We're still here where death is still a thing and there's sorrow is still a thing and tears are still a thing and pain is still a thing. And so here, people are going, we're living in a time where God has promised something, but we have the fear and bondage of death, not knowing how God's going to deal with it. Christ comes and dies. Say, oh, I see by his power of resurrection, I see by his death for sins, how this is possible. But that hasn't happened yet. So how do we who live here think about death? If we're not in bondage to it. I mean, in one sense, we are in bondage. We're all going to die. But in another sense, we have the hope of resurrection, right? So how are we supposed to respond to this? Doesn't raise, see how it raises the question? How Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection changes or should change the way we think about it. The question now we're asking is, how does it change it? Are my feelings wrong? Well, no, we already discovered your feelings are natural because death is terrible. Right? But when you know truth, you have some doctrinal information... When you learn what God teaches through his word, the glory of God's word is it changes your mind, which can change your response. Okay? People often say, well, Justin, well, they don't often say, but it's been said to me before, that Justin, you talk about doctrine, but you don't talk very much about people's feelings and emotions. Well, I've done that before. I've talked about feelings and emotions, but here's the truth of it, is that biblical emotions, right, 
come as a result of what you're thinking. Okay, that's true. You will have emotions naturally without understanding God's word. And those emotions will, a lot of the time, be incorrectly informed, wrong. Right? It's kind of like young children and toddlers, which I have one now, and they emote about things you don't need to. You know, it's like, I understand the emotion's legit. It's like, I understand you're sad, okay? But just because you dropped half your cookie on the floor, and thus the saying, don't cry over spilt milk. You know, it's like, you get some more milk. You know, so this is the concept. And again, I'm not making light of people's sorrow of people dying. That's a serious and terrible thing, okay? All I'm saying is that you respond to this world with frustration and with uh, despair or with, uh, with anger, right? Or with love or with joy. And a lot of times people's emotions are driven simply by the circumstances as it bumps into them. Sunny day? I like that. Happy. Rainy day? I don't like that. Sad. You know, th- this is a, a very generic type of example. Right? But this is how emotions happen. It's like, if, does it frustrate me or not? I mean, what, how does the circumstance affect me? But then you start learning truth and you realize that knowing something, knowing something that is true, can actually change the way you respond to something that before you responded differently. Right? And so I, at one point, might have thought, well, bad things are happening to me. That makes me feel bad because it makes me think that God doesn't like me. Right? Now, what would you understand God's grace today answer that? It doesn't mean that God doesn't like you. In fact, God committed his love toward you, that while he, you were still a sinner, he died for you. You're justified with, with God by faith. You have peace with him. The verse says in Romans 5, verse 1, you're at peace with God. The follow-up question then is, why do these bad things happen? Well, that's a legitimate question, but it's like, we should take away, deal with this feeling that you have that God doesn't like me. Well, let me give you some truth about that. God's trying to save us. Christ died for you. He committed his love for you there. And you're at peace with him. If you believe the gospel, you're at peace with God. Right? He wants to give you eternal life. And so that changes, with that knowledge, it changes how you respond. Right? That's the idea. And as we apply it also to death, what we know from the Bible and its true reality changes how we can respond to the most grievous affliction of humanity. And I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy, folks. It's one thing to hear. It's another thing, like I said, to apply the thing. It's not easy. But it works. And it's true. Okay? And when you're strong in faith, that is strong in what the Bible says, that it is true, it will change your response to death in such a way that you will look crazy to the world. Because death is the most terrible thing that comes upon humanity. And you'll respond to it differently, and people will go, how can you do that? And sometimes they'll say, you're making a mockery of it. And you know what the biblical response to that is? Yep. In Psalms... God laughs those in derision, okay, because he puts death to shame, do you understand? But you've got to know that before that even makes sense to you. Because people without that knowledge, that's the most terrible thing, it's the most hopeless thing that could ever happen. There's no solution, right? So how are you helping is the response, right? We should help. The Bible says in Romans 12, verse 15, to weep with those that weep, right? We have to acknowledge the seriousness of death. Solomon does that. Read Ecclesiastes. Solomon acknowledges the vanity of life and the terrible nature of death. He actually says in Ecclesiastes 7, it's actually better the day you die than the day you're born. If you really want to get depressed, read Solomon in Ecclesiastes. You say, how is my death day better than my birth day? Well, I think God perhaps was using Solomon to allude to something more, but Solomon actually says that because he says life is so vain and meaningless, and the fact that you might have any peace and comfort at all is just a matter of chance, and so you might as well die. You're going, that's terrible. Well, well, yeah, but that's the logical conclusion. Solomon was pretty wise. Without hope, you're delaying the inevitable. And if your life doesn't have meaning or doesn't have pleasure, then what's the point? Right? I'll tell you the point. The point is God gave you life, and he gave you the hope of eternal life, and you trust Jesus Christ, you can magnify and know his glory forever. That's hope, folks, and it's true hope. Okay? Suicide should be guarded against because you need to know the truth about death is that it is not the end. It is not the loss of all things. You don't have to fear it, okay? And the fact that it has a time problem, the fact that you might have regrets and guilts and grudges, God deals with your guilt too. God gives you the solution, the salvation from all the pains and stings of death. Right? You say, well, it still hurts. I know it does because we're still here, folks. We're not experiencing glory. We're in our flesh, we have investment in people, and it's really hard for us to look outside of our narrow purview, to look out to eternity, to look up and affect things that are above. We're constantly looking now, right? 
they teach you as a minister uh, when you're doing funeral services to, to, to realize that, you know, the funeral really isn't about the dead person. They're dead. The funeral is about the living people. And that pretty much defines the whole response to humanity to death. You know, I might be cold-hearted to say it's selfish, but re really that's the thing. It's for the living people, right? You can't do anything to the dead person, right? But everyone else needs comforted. They're still hurt. And so you do what you can through the funeral service or the celebration of life or the remembrance of the memorials of what they did and how they affected you or, or to, to glory in the, 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 the small things in life and to continue living your life, you know, to enjoy it because that's what they would have wanted. And we do all these things to try to, to make us feel better about the fact that everyone dies. In reality, God's given us truth. That's all we need to feel better about what happens because he actually solved the problem. And I keep saying this because Christians have known this for millennia, thousands of years. And yet, the hard part is Christians not just hearing it and knowing it, but actually believing it enough to live by it. Because that takes not only strength of understanding and faith, but courage. Right? Because how offensive can it be to talk about something as important as death so lightly as if it's a light affliction? Is that what the Bible does? How can it be a light affliction? I mean, I'm going through pain here. I understand. I mean, that, that's hard because this is why I'm seeing you go through this pain. I'm going through pain. Yet the Bible says light affliction compared to what? You know, compared to what? Romans 8, 18, the hope of glory that shall be revealed in us. But you only know that by faith, folks, because we're not there. You see what I'm talking about? Death is a challenge for Christians, too. We hear the gospel. We believe the gospel. But it's a challenge for us, too, because we don't yet live in Revelation 21. So how do you know that's what God's goal is? Maybe God just forgot about us. No, he didn't. Scripture doesn't, tells me he, does, he hasn't, right? What is God doing today? Well, isn't that a dispensational question? It is a dispensational question. So you can see how starting the Bible rightly divided, knowing what God's going today actually helps you with this big problem as well of death. Because the Bible says he wants to remove it, but it hasn't happened yet. So what is he doing? He's trying to get people saved because he removes it for those that believe, that trust, that have faith, Right? And so we have that. Removing sorrow and the pain of death, and I know that I sound like a one-trick pony, but I can't get around it. The Bible teaches it. It's a Pauline truth. Okay? When Jesus was on earth, he talked about his dying for sins, and how did his disciples respond? Nope, not going to do it. We're going to protect you. You're not going to die, especially at a young age, Jesus. I mean, that'd be terrible. Right? We're going to keep you living as long as possible. Right? So you can bring this kingdom in. Peter gets a sword, tries to defend him, and Jesus says, let me die. I mean, you see how strange that their response to that is, like, what? Then Jesus raises from the dead, and Peter gets it. He goes, oh, okay, you fulfilled the scriptures. You had to raise from the dead. I get it. Now you defeated the power of death. He reached the two. I get it. You freed us from the bondage of that fear. Wonderful. And now we have a hope, a future hope, of waiting for when there's no more death. And the teaching is, since Jesus did it, if you endure you'll receive right, this hope of a kingdom. Peter says in 1 Peter 1 that Jesus renewed the hope in us through his resurrection. The hope of what? Salvation in the future over here. right? The glory that shall be on the earth. That's what Jesus has done. And so the fact that Christ defeated the power of death is what Peter preaches as well. The power that Jesus exhibited by his resurrection means that he has the power to return to this earth and establish his kingdom where there's no more death. Right? But remember, the power of death is just one problem with death. What's the second problem? Pain. Right? Peter had nothing to say about that. He did talk about suffering. And his, this was his response, okay, to suffering in this life. Peter goes, in 1 Peter 2, you can read about it. He says, Jesus suffered, so you suffer. Follow the leader. Right? And... Okay, at least someone went before you, right? But that doesn't make it easier at all. It's like, okay, Jesus did it. I'm following Jesus. I'm taking up my cross. What does John say? If you need to give up your life, right? Well, that was the thing we were fearing in the beginning with. <laughs> okay, now I've got maybe the courage because now they've got the leader going into the battle. The leader says, follow me into death. And you're going, okay, Jesus. And you're following into death. Okay. What's missing here? It still stings. It still hurts. Right? It's with Paul's revelation and Paul's truth that immortality and life 
is taught to remove, or at the very least, reduce the pain and sting of death. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Revelation 21 is future, folks. There will be no more pain then. What about now? But when Paul starts teaching, according to the mystery of Christ, that you can have pain removed now. I'm not talking about physical healing. I'm talking about the sorrow, the emotional sting that, re- that corresponds with death. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, and thus, you know, what do we do when Christians die? Those who believe the gospel, those who are saved, who are in Christ, and how do we respond who are still alive and that remain? 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. God has a calling that was according to his own purpose and grace, which will be given to us in Christ before the world began, verse 9, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. That's the resurrected Lord. Peter saw him, Paul saw him. But look what it says Jesus Christ did. He hath abolished death. How did he do that? By his resurrection, right? He abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. Now that's the second part. There's the, the fact that he abolished death, the power of it. Then there's the part where there's pain and sting and, and the terrible despair that results from it as well. And he says he brought immortality to light. So it's one thing to promise it. It's another thing to say this is what immortality looks like. Right? Now, he didn't bring that to our eyes. Like, we don't see it in this earth. But how do we know about immortality? We read about it. Okay. To Paul, he revealed not only that you can have eternal life, but what that looks like so that it can change your mind, so you can live in this world by faith, not by sight, and you might not have sorrow about death. You understand? That is an achievable thing, is what I'm saying. It's not a common thing, but it's possible by God's grace. Okay. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 3. The teaching of God's grace, specifically the mystery fellowship with Christ, gives us, in Romans 5, verse 3, the assurance of life. People talk about eternal security. and Are we saved? Are we not saved? How do we know? How do we stay saved? And haven't we talked at length about the difference between God's covenant program with Israel, in which they have promised salvation but don't have it yet, right? And the dispensation of God's grace, whereby we have a present possession, of salvation, right? The difference between something you possess and something that you're promised is a big difference. Being promised it is good, possessing it is better, right? And so the knowledge of God's grace that gives us assured life in Christ, Romans 5 verse uh, 3 says, we stand in God's grace and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We'll mention later, we'll talk about how that when you die, you're no longer hoping for glory. Because you're there. But it says we rejoice in the hope of glory. So we now, who don't yet have the glory, can have joy in the hope of glory. Right? Because we stand and have access by faith into this grace. And it says we glory in tribulations also. Because of our stand of position in Christ, because of our grace position in the Lord Jesus Christ and his body, we glory in tribulations. Is death tribulation? That's an understatement. Yes, it's a tribulation, right? Paul says we glory in tribulations also. That's not something Peter did, necessarily. I mean, he followed Jesus' example, but they're not glory in tribulations. I mean, they're waiting for the kingdom glory to come, right? But this is the, the power of the preaching of God's grace in Christ Jesus to you in this dispensation, is that you can glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to you already. He goes on to say that God committed his love towards you, that while you're yet sinners, he died for you, he delivers you from the wrath to come, and you have now the atonement. He's explaining benefit after benefit after benefit that you have now. Right? It sounds like Paul is trying to encourage people who at one time were stuck under the fear and bondage of death and saying, look, you have blessings now. Not just like the hope of future, but like right now, you can rejoice in these things. Okay, I hear that. I hear what you're saying. You also hear that glorying in tribulations is not necessarily um, a natural thing to do, right? It requires you to understand who you are in Christ and what Christ done to you and have that strength of faith, right? But the verse says it's possible, right? 
verse says we can glory in tribulations because of what we know by God's grace. Because of where Christ has put us by his grace. And he starts listing blessing after blessing according to the mystery in Romans chapter 5. Look at Romans chapter uh, 5 down in verse 17. If by one man's offense death reigned by one. Again, death reigning, that is the reality. Everyone dies. If death reigns by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. And so just as by one man all sin and all die, by one man all can live. Right? That's the teaching. And it's, you can live by Jesus Christ. And down in, in verse uh, 20, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. Question, when does grace reign? In the future? Now. So what's it say? That when grace reigns, you're still under the sorrow and fear and pain and sting of death? Or does it say when grace reigns, you can have life now. You don't have to wait for it or try to work for it or endure to the end or wait till the kingdom comes. You have grace now, which gives you life now, which gives you righteousness now, and you can have that glory now. Obviously, it's not glory that you're seeing visibly with your eyes. It's glory that you have by faith that you're walking in, right? But that should definitely, if it's changing your mind, change the way you respond to circumstances, right? That's why Paul says we glory in tribulations, right? That's what he says then. Look at Romans 8, 38. A couple chapters later, after drilling in this teaching of grace and who it makes you and your identity and that you have the Spirit and what the Spirit does for you today in Romans 8, 38. By the way, today, as we're living under death, but it's actually under grace. Grace abounds over death, right? Romans 8, 38. Look what it says. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. Remember we talked about evangelism a couple weeks ago? Persuaded has to do with you believing it. I'm just saying I understand what you're saying, but like believing it. I'm persuaded. I am persuaded that neither death, down in verse 39, shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your death has no power to affect your position in Christ Jesus. At one point, it did. People were waiting in the Old Testament, and they were waiting in Peter's ministry to die. Because when they died, they would face the Lord in judgment, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and they were counting on the promise of life at that judgment. So the judgment was when they died, or if the kingdom came first, right? Sure, came first, but everyone, the kingdom hasn't come, therefore everyone was waiting until they died. And they would wait until they died, and when they died, they knew they would face God, and God would determine whether or not they deserved life or death, based on their faith or what have you, right? Based on his judgment. But the judgment, the point of decision, was death, right? I mean, they didn't choose to live. It was like God chose for them to live or not, right? When is it determined that you will live forever? Is it when you die? No. It's now. It's already when you trust the gospel. Because Christ died for you. And when you trust the gospel, you're crucified with him. So your death has already happened as far as the judgment is concerned, right? And so what happened to the fear of judgment after death? The anxiety that results of, is God going to accept me? Gone. Totally gone. You have no fear at all that God should accept you if you trust the gospel of the grace of God. But that wasn't true back here. That wasn't true even here. It's true under this dispensation. Right? So you see already the sorrow and stings being removed by grace teaching. Right? Where's the fear that religion might bring on it? It's gone. Right? Wow. That's amazing, folks. That's glorious. We need to talk more about death. But you see what happens naturally, we don't, we don't want it, because we know it hurts people, and it's hurt us, and then we just, we don't know about it. Our message is death being conquered by Christ. Right? So we have a brother or a sister who dies. Why not say, that guy knew Christ, this is how we respond to that. Right? You say, I'm filled with sorrow and pain and regret and sadness. Christ solved all that. He solved it for him, he solves it for you. Right? I'm talking to Christians here. Unbelievers, you've got to have pity to understand that the unbeliever doesn't know this stuff, or they don't believe it, not persuaded of it. And the big, the big terror for those that don't trust this truth is that there is no hope when you die. There's no hope now. You'll face sting and pain and sorrow abounding when you think about death. But the salvation of Christ today is that you can right now be delivered from the pain and sorrow and fear of death. Right now. Right? The worst thing about someone dying when you're a Christian and you hear about someone dying, the first thought in my mind is, were they saved? Because that's all that matters. If they were, 
What do I have to fear about them? Why do I have to be sad about them? Right? You say, well, they're taken away too soon. I understand. But what's the Christian belief? They're still alive. Right? But see, this is not true for those who don't believe in the gospel of Christ. And that's why it, is, it still hurts when unbelievers die. And you're going, I know they didn't believe. Yeah, it hurts, doesn't it? That's the same hurt we all felt before God revealed His grace. You understand? That was the condition of everybody. Even the saints of the past had to wait until death to find out. I mean, they trusted God. God, I put it in your hands, you know. But they wouldn't know until they died. They faced God and God made that choice. Right? And God promised some of them and that sort of thing. But God revealed the manifold wisdom of Himself that we can now know. And what a glory that is. Galatians 2.20, it says we're crucified with Christ. We're crucified with Him. Our message is an instrument of death. If death is the problem, okay, Christ became a man and died to defeat the power of death. He then says you can, by grace, be already crucified. So you don't have to wait until you die. You can trust Christ and be dead already. Right? Get it over with. Get the anxiety out of the way. Secure your losses, right? Not the, worth, the worldly riches, right? I'm not about the time you have left in this life. Use it for something eternal. Thus the, the teaching, redeem the time. Because you can't redeem anything if all of your life is living up to death. But once you die in Christ, the rest of your life is eternal, folks. So you can redeem it for eternal things, knowing that. Okay? Galatians 6.14, Paul, instead of being... When Christ died, his disciples had despair, folks. They mourned, okay, when he died. You say, well, he was a close friend. Now, no doubt he was a close friend to them, but you read on the Emmaus Road why they were distraught, and it's because we thought he was the king, right? They didn't know something, did they? They didn't know that he was the king, and he had to die. That information changed their response to his death, right? Galatians 6.14, the information God gave to Paul, he says, I don't want you just to know about my death and know that it needed to happen and know that I needed to do it to, to accomplish resurrection and, and defeat the power of death. But I want you to know so that you can glory in it. You can glory in the cross. He says, God forbid that I glory saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world's crucified to me and I into the world. You say, well, this kind of thinking about death is not the way the world thinks. Exactly. Okay. The way the world thinks is no longer the way you think, and the way you think is not what the world is going to accept. But it's truth. And perhaps the more Christians respond to death in the way the Scripture says we should, the more people will see the present power that the gospel of Christ has. Right? Christians so often think about, as in the terms of Peter, that salvation is only a future thing or something, and it's not. Like right now, death is afflicting the world, and we have a solution. Some people were dying in COVID. This was part of the problem with the whole, the, the cultural response to the disease. People were dying and death is terrible. Death is terrible. But the Christians go, and me is going, I'm, I'm in Christ. I'm going, but they can have eternal life. Shut down the churches. They're not essential. Not essential. We're talking about eternal life. We're talking about people who are going to die one way or another. Already the other day, they were figuring out that not everybody, but a large number of people who are dying from COVID over the age of 80 were dying this year anyway. And they got COVID, and they just they died from that instead. I'm not diminishing the, the whole seriousness of it. I'm simply saying that people will die even without COVID, right? The gospel of God's grace is essential, okay, for people to take away, if anything, the fear, the pain, the sting of hundreds of thousands of people dying, or you dying and facing it, right? It helps greatly, and perhaps many of you have been helped by that as well, right? Or it diminishes the fear. If not, removes it altogether. In 1 Corinthians 15, the church is instructed by Jesus Christ to remember his death till he come. Till he come. When does he come? Here. So before the kingdom, we're supposed to remember his death. Why? Is it going to be some sad memorial? Yeah, he suffered a lot when he died. He was beaten with whips, crown of thorns. Horrible. Yeah, it was terrible. Death is terrible. That's not what he's saying when he says, remember my death. He's talking about, when I died, I shed my blood for you, and I rose from the dead for you. And you all come together because of me, because of what I did, and because it can remove the sorrow and pain of death. Remember what I did for you. That's what the church is supposed to remember. You don't need to remember that anymore when he comes, because why? When he comes, 
I'm not dealing with death anymore, folks. Right? That's why that is. But when Christians only think about Christ's death as the sad suffering of it and forget the glory that we have in it, Galatians 6.14, that's Pauline truth. And they've missed the point. They've missed the message. The mind of Christ leads us to be conformed to the death of Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 2, Know you not, those of you who are baptized are baptized into Christ's death. His death is a positive thing for you. And your death is a positive thing for you, because if you don't reckon yourselves indeed dead into sin, then you'll be walking in sin. Right? So now suddenly the instrument that was the source of our hopelessness and bondage is now this tool that delivers us from sin. You see how he totally reversed this? He makes it a glorious thing. And I'm not taking pleasure in death, in Christ, is, is who we take pleasure in. Look at Philippians 3, verse 10. Paul says that he would know the fellowship of his sufferings so that, there's a reason for this. He's talking about his life and having sufferings in this life. And he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now Paul knows he's going to raise from the dead because he trusts Christ. Do that for him. He's talking about now. He wants to live the resurrected, glorious understanding now. And so he's going to rejoice in the fellowship of the sufferings he has with Christ as a minister of Christ so that he can know the power of the resurrection now. You understand? He's not saying I'm going to sit in the, the defeat of suffering. I'm going to compare it to the glory God's given to me so I can live in resurrection. That's what's called the resurrected life. Okay. He says in the same chapter, Philippians chapter 3, down in verse 12, it's not as though I had already attained, and thank God for that, because I'm talking about what the doctrine teaches us, and we still hurt when death happens. Paul says it's not as I already attained to this sort of thing, but this is what God, the power of Christ, has for us. Either we're, either we're already perfect, but I follow after, if I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We had a lesson on this a couple years ago. Do you know what that mark is? What is the mark he's pressing on toward? Death. It's the, invisible, it's the mark no one wants to talk about. It's the mark everyone wants to avoid. It's the mark you're trying to run away from and neglect, Right? But according to the gospel of Christ, according to his position in Christ, he says, I press toward that mark. Why do you press toward it? Because he says, if I'm crucified with Christ, I can be risen with Christ. I want to know his power now, resurrection. I, I press toward the mark for the, look at the word, prize. The teaching of Christ is that when you die, you get a prize. Now, that sounds kind of elementary, but I mean, that's the truth of it. I mean, you didn't know that before. Before it was like, death is the end. I'm, I'm fearing the stop of life and everything. But now, what if when you die, you get reward? Oh, well, that's something. What is that thing exactly? Right? You start researching that out according to Pauline truth, and you're going, that's a lot of stuff. I don't mean stuff in the material sense. I mean a lot of things that Christ has done for you. He calls them the unsearchable riches. Look at Philippians chapter 1. The ancients used to have a, a, a saying about dying a good death. You've heard this idea? Dying a good death. And what that meant uh, in, in books like The Art of Dying back in the Middle Ages uh, was to live a good life. That way, when you die to the end of it, you can say, I lived well, so my death will be well. That sounds good. And some people die that way, they think. What's the problem that you know according to the Scripture with this? There's none righteous. No, not one. Right? And none of us can live entirely well, right? And so we all have regrets. We all have things we thought we shouldn't have done or things we could have done better, right? And how do you get saved from this sort of guilt? The gospel of God's grace, right? Christianity talks about a good death as one that you die to the glory of Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. Death is terrible, there's no, no sense in that death itself is a good end, right? Christ died in order to die for you so he can raise from the dead and defeat the power of it. But Christianity teaches a good death for the Christian is when you die to the glory of Christ. Philippians 1 verse 20, Paul says this. He says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. 
the church likes to talk about magnifying and glorifying Christ. Okay? And they typically talk about that in the sense of what are you going to do with your life? Well, you should do all you do in your life to the glory of God. But they tend to forget that part of what you're going to do in your life is die. Okay? And Paul says, whether it be by life or by death, he's going to magnify Christ. And the question should arise in your mind, how do I magnify Christ by my death? I mean, I can magnify Christ in his death, right? Like, he died for me. He did it all, right? That's easy. But how does my death magnify Christ? Right? Well, it's not surely how we lived. Because we didn't get saved that way. Right? Surely it's not that way. How can we magnify Christ in our death? Look at Philippians 1, verse 21. He does, he does it right after he says this. You know this verse. To me, for me to live is Christ, which means that I'm in him, he's in me. To live is Christ means that he put on humanity and suffered before he died, and so you're going to put on humanity and suffer before you die. Right? Well, what do you say about death? To die is gain. You see, the point he's making in verse 20 is not about magnifying Christ in his life, though he says that. He's trying to teach the Philippians that even though you're scared for my life, Philippians, Paul says, you can still magnify Christ, and I'll magnify Christ by my death. I'll have a glorious death. How so? Because for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. That was never the idea of death. It's not like when you die, you get more. No, no, no. It was like when you die, you're done. You give up. You don't leave with it. You didn't take it with you. Right? But what if the real teaching, and the Bible's true, that when you die, you gain? You've been trying to gain things your whole life. Some of you have achieved a level of gain, and some of you have not. In any event, what if it's when you died, you receive gain? Wouldn't that be something you start to look forward to? Some of us more than others, perhaps, but all of us should, right? That you're going to gain when you die? Then when a Christian dies, knowing that he will gain, why is it that we're sad for them? You say, we're not sad for them, we're sad for people that remain. I get that, but if you're a Christian and you remain, why aren't you happy for them? Now, I said at the beginning, it's natural for us to feel sad about death. And you weep with those that weep, but the verse also says, rejoice with them that rejoice. And when you're rejoicing over the death of someone, Christians have the, the privilege and the opportunity to rejoice with them. I met with Terry's wife, Sister Carol, this last Monday. And you walk in preparing for anything, because death's terrible. And when she says, Terry's having a great day today, I'm going, amen. <laughs> yes. You glory in that. That's how you glory Christ in your death. Right? You magnify him in your death, because without Christ, you're not having a great day when you die. But with Christ, your death day is the best day of your life. Amen. Do you understand? We don't think of it that way. We think, when I die, that's when I'm at my lowest. Isn't that just like God? When you're at your lowest, He's at His best. Right? And when you die, and you can't breathe another breath, what He does is gives you life when you trust the gospel. Do you even know, even according to Scripture, how to plan your journey to heaven? I mean, like, which star do you follow, Peter Pan? You know, it's like, what do you do? You know, I have no idea. But all I know is that Christ said, I'll resurrect, I'll be with him in glory. So I don't know if it's like an elevator or some sort of like, you know, angels, you're on a, you know, angel's back or something, or it's just like that twinkling of an eye idea, you know, it's just like suddenly you wake up or, but the verses are clear, the absent from the body is present with the Lord. You know that from the Bible. Nobody on earth told you that. The Bible told you that. And so Christians look at the dead body and go, he's not there. How do you know? The Bible says he's present with the Lord if you knew the gospel, right? Which means the loss that I'll never talk to that person again, the regret that I should have said goodbye, I should have said I love you. Guess what? If you're a Christian and they're a Christian, you get to say it again. It's just a moving of place, right? They're somewhere else for a time and you'll see them again. And that's not just an empty comfort, like some metaphysical thing. It's like a reality. That's what it means to, be, to have faith, to have that strong faith. This is what grace is supposed to teach. And this is... I hope you're seeing the, the significance of how it's uniquely according to the revelation of the mystery of Christ that we see this. It's not that Christians who don't rightly divide can't understand it. It's in their Bible. What I'm saying is the revelation in your Bible is Pauline. Paul is the one that glories in his death. Paul is the one that says, I rejoice on the day that I die that I'll be with him in heaven. Paul teaches you that. And I'm not saying, Paul, of course, Christ told Paul that. So it's not about the man you know, it's about Christ's revelation of it. But the manifold wisdom of God they are revealed in the mystery that death, the greatest obstacle and affliction of humanity, is now defeated. Not just the power of it, but the pain of it can really drastically affect the way you view your life. Because what can stop you now? If death was unstoppable, 
and God's grace abounds over death, what stops you? Nothing. Is something threatening your life? It's a small thing. Right? I'm not saying be careless. I'm just saying it has a lot less effect than what it would have before. Before, your life was all there was. Now. But now, there's something far greater. Right? There's a prize. Romans 6.23 says, The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 15.57 says, O death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? We sing victory in Jesus that comes from 1 Corinthians 15. Talking about victory over death. So we sing about victory in Jesus. And then we have a funeral and we sing, We're going to miss you. We will miss him. We should be singing victory in Jesus. We should be singing when we all get to heaven because they're there now. We're the one we're, we're behind. I wrote yesterday in the email that Brother Terry missed the rapture. And you've got to think about that for a moment. We spend so much time trying to defend the rapture teaching down here, and most of us won't even be in it. You understand that? <laughs> most of the members of the body of Christ will not go up in the rapture. It's only those that are alive and remain at that time that go up in the rapture that are believers. The rest of us are going to die. But the good part of that is that the rest of us will live long lives, you know, perhaps, you know, if the rapture comes and you're like not ready for it, yet, you know, people have this conversation. We're going to live our lives and die and be in glory before the rapture happens. So, in one sense, what's the point? Rapture, not rapture. The, the, the only reason why you talk about the rapture is to separate prophecy and mystery, and this is that dispensational chart idea. Right? Otherwise, uh, when we die, we're in glory. And that's what's going to happen to most of us. Okay? Paul says we're present with the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, If we die with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we die with Him. Right? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought a good fight, Paul says. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, you mean there's something after your death, Paul? Yes. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. What day does he get it? He's got to die, folks. He's got to die. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 3, or, or you can remember it in your brain. It says, you have all spiritual blessings, Where? In heavenly places. Where does a Christian go when he dies? Heavenly places. So apparently they experience the spiritual blessings more than you have now. Like, you're trying to acknowledge them. Like, they are living it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. Look what grace teaches us. And we've heard these verses before. These are, this is not new information to you. What I'm trying to do is apply this to our emotional response to death as Christians, when Christians die, because it should change our, our response. Ephesians 2, verse 7. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Ephesians 3, 6 talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. Okay? It's amazing stuff. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Paul tells us to set our affections on things above. And part of that's not just because... Heavenly things are better than earthly things. That's because if you're only looking at the things of this earth, you will face the pain and sting and death of this earth. But when you're setting your affections, the things you desire, the things you think about on things above, it helps you now as far as your response to the pain and sufferings of this life. You're in Colossians chapter 1. The mystery of Christ, in verse 27, is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right? You have the hope. We rejoice in the hope. It's a great mystery that we understand today. And yet, when you die, it's no longer a hope. You're actually in it. Romans 8.18 says, The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in you. When does that happen? When you die, folks. You, you get promoted to glory, graduated to glory. You go on to glory. Okay? We don't, we, we don't see the glory in our flesh. We have to believe it and walk by faith. And that helps. But when you die, you're in it, folks. You get a glorified body. Right? Yeah, amen. We, this vile body is exchanged for the body and glorious body that Christ has. Right? <clears throat> Romans 18 says it's not worthy to be compared. We've been spent the first half of the lesson talking about the seriousness and the gravity and the weight of death. It's so serious. We should not take it lightly. Right? And then Romans 8.18 comes along and says, it's not worthy to be compared to the glory. If I came to you and said, I'll give you a billion dollars if you just walk up off that pew and stand up here next to me, what would be your response? 
Yeah. Well, wait a minute. It's a lot of suffering here. You got to stand in front of this big crowd. You got to like bend your knees up. You know, you got to walk up. It's a small thing. It's a small thing. Right? I mean, this is what it says. It's not worthy to be compared. Death is terrible, so terrible. But the Bible says grace abounds over it, and the glory is so much greater that it's not worthy to be compared. But the only way you know that glory exists is because you trust Jesus Christ and his gospel and his word. What evidence is there that eternal glory exists? Has any scientist discovered this? Have they come back from the dead to say it's there? The only one it has is Jesus. By trusting what he said, you know that it's there, and he says it's not worthy to be compared to the magnitude of death. Right? We have an eternal weight of glory that so surpasses the heaviness of death that if Christians would embrace that in our response to death, I think that would be a great testimony to the world. When they say, why can you rejoice when this person died? And you say, because I know something about death for the Christian. Right? I also know, but I experience the reality of the pain of death of the unbeliever. Right? So I can minister those things. You see? The Christian boldness of death is not ignoring the pain. It's not ignoring suffering. And you say, oh, I still hurt. I still suffer with death. And this is natural. I told you it's natural. Weep with those that weep. But the Bible gives us every reason to rejoice. And so as our minds are changed to have the mind of Christ, it should be thinking more and more about the glory that is promised to us on the day we die and meet the Lord in the air, right? And so we sing a song like, what a day that will be when Christ Jesus I shall see, the glory of his face, right? Don't to save me by his grace. We sing these songs, and they're so victorious, and that we're singing about your death day, you understand. We're singing about your death. And yet we rejoice because Christ saved us from the pain of it, right? Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, this final verse, and I'm going to show you this. 1 Thessalonians 4. Pauline truth. People come here to talk, try to talk about the rapture, and you're missing the point of what Paul's communicating here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says in verse 13, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. What's that mean? You better know some stuff about what God said. Don't be ignorant, because if you are ignorant, this isn't going to work. Right? Don't be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, who is who's he talking about? Those who are dead, but which people that are dead? Christians. Save people that are dead. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. Paul's instruction is, don't be sad over the death of Christians. Isn't that what he says right there, very clear? Now you say, that's hard, because I still suffer. I have memories, and I have life. And it. Yeah, I get it. That's all natural. But according to what we now know, the instruction, the, the goal, is to not sorrow after them, because we remember what Christ did, and we know what's happening to them. They're having their best day yet. They're having glory, things that we can't imagine yet. Right? Pity on us, you know. But we can sing that we have the same hope and faith that we will one day be with them in glory. Right? So Paul says that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, because you can rejoice in the hope of glory. Right? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the abundant blessings that we don't deserve, that you've given us freely through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light, who's taken away our corruption and our resurrection, taken away our mortality, and given us uh, something that is worthy of joy, not of pain and not of sorrow. We thank you for this enlightenment and this knowledge. I pray that we would communicate it to others, evangelize them, so that may, they may be persuaded that death cannot separate them from your love, and that they will not lose for eternity in you. They have nothing to fear in you, and they have no more guilt in you. We thank you, Father, and thank you for all the power that you provide through the cross. Amen.